Okay, good. Underneath this, please, and you're working, could you draw for me a new set of axes? Again, please use your ruler. This whole discussion of scale becomes very, very difficult if you don't have something accurate to work off. So this is one. Hmm. Now, we're going to do this one faster because you know a lot about this shape already on the basis of the previous one that you did, right? So, when x equals 2? So, before we start launching into this, right, um, one of the things that's really important is whenever you look at a new mathematical problem, you connect it to, and I don't mean this is an exaggeration, you connect it to every mathematical problem you have ever solved before because all the things, the principles and knowledge you gain there will help you here. And it just so happens we just did a problem here which is highly relevant to this one over here. But there are some important differences and that's why I'm doing it as its own thing and not messing it up on the same graph. What's the difference between this graph and that one? Yeah, Ian. Okay, it's been shifted vertically one unit downwards. Do you agree with that? Okay, so in some senses what I could do is I could just take this shape and I could just redraw it all over again over here. Okay, and in some senses that will be what I do, but I want to think about this through the lens of how we did this before. Before we started looking for like intercepts, right? So for example, if I think about the first thing, I'm going to write this, I'm going to search for a y-intercept by letting x equal 0, right? So when x equals 0, I'm going to get y equals, look carefully, I'm going to do the substitution so that I know which one I'm talking about, right? Because I don't want to lean on my instincts if I'm not 100% confident in them. So I'm going to go 0 cubed minus 1, and that's negative 1. Yeah? You okay with that? So that's my y-intercept. Say that again. Well, this is a point we won't worry about too much right now, but the short answer is negative is an adjective. It's a thing you use to describe things like a number. That number is a negative number. Minus is actually an operation. It's something that happens between two numbers. In our brains, they mostly feel the same, but um, Shane Barber, can I borrow your calculator? Is that yours? Yeah. You might actually notice, uh, maybe you never noticed, on your calculator, there is a minus button. It's that one down here with the plus and the multiplication and the division. That's a minus button. It operates between two numbers. And then did you ever notice there was like a little minus button up in the top? It's between brackets. Did you notice that? That's the negative button. That's a negative number. Now, it just so happens that you know, when you subtract something, it's the same as adding it if it were negative. But that's why you'll hear me saying negative 1 because that's a number, not an operation. What point am I going to put onto my graph as a consequence of this? Uh, negative 0, one. comma, negative, negative, negative one. 1. Right. So I'm doing this to myself so I remember where this goes on the graph. So this is a y-intercept, so I'm going to put that there. OK? Now. I've only found a y-intercept. Over here when I did this one, I found an x-intercept and a y-intercept at the same time. It's kind of like, ooh, that's nice, bit of a bonus. But I have not found a y-intercept at the moment. So, sorry, I've not found an x-intercept, so I need to find one. If this is how I find a y-intercept, how do I find an x-intercept? Let y equal 0, right? So when y equals 0, and I'm just going to do the same substitution that I did before, right? So I'm going to say 0 equals x cubed minus 1. You can see it's gone into the y, right? So I can add 1 to both sides. And I'm going to switch the sides while I'm at it because the x is the thing I'm focused on. And what's the number that I multiply by itself three times to get 1? Do you agree with that? Okay. So I can now put a different point onto my axes, for, onto my Cartesian plane for this. There's the x coordinate. There's a y coordinate, right? So that's 1, 0, right? Which is here. Which corresponds to, do you remember we found this point, 1, 1, right? We found that on this graph, but what we've done is we've taken everything here and we've moved it down, as Ian suggested, one unit vertically, okay? So you can see I'm going to get this shape here, and it's just going to be like what it was before, except, as we've pointed out, it's one unit lower. Okay. 
y, x, and I've been a bit naughty. I've been leaving off each of these times. We should label what the equation is as well. So that's y equals x cubed. Okay, now, just before we leave off this, right? These graphs are okay. Um, there's a few thing to, things to point out. The first one is, do you notice for both of these and for all of the graphs that we're looking at, right? The graph kind of is steep in some points and it's um, shallow at others. Did you notice that, right? Like the gradient of our line, it changes. So that's different to our, our linear graphs where it's just always the same gradient everywhere. Right? Now you might notice there's this special spot on both of these graphs where the gradient is not just shallow. If you take your ruler, which I don't have. I'm going to pinch your ruler, Alex. May I? Thank you. If you take your ruler, right, and you place it right across that spot there, in this case, it actually happens to be the x-axis. Over here, it's not the x-axis. It's this point here. Okay? It's kind of like um, the, the steepness of the graph kind of stops momentarily. Scale. Stops, and then it goes back up. Okay? All right, now. <laughs> Kind of, but not really. Now, I'm going to introduce some language here that won't be as relevant until later, but I think it's helpful for you to know so you can talk about this spot. This spot here, and on this one here, this spot here, because it's like, if you can imagine, like, a man or a car sort of like running up, driving up, running up, and then getting to this point and then going off, right? This point here is sort of like where it stops for a brief moment, and then it keeps going, right? We call that point, going with the idea of something stopping and being motionless, we call it a stationary point. Stationary with an A as opposed to stationary with an E, like this is stationary and this is stationary. This is a stationary point. And it's really important when you graph this, that the graph at that little moment in time is flat. Okay, it's not kind of at an angle, it's literally flat, okay? Um, if we were to draw this line through, that should be a tangent, it should have the same gradient there, okay? Now this word here really, or this phrase rather, becomes really important when we dig into calculus, so this is actually calculus language, but because we're dealing with these graphs, we really need to be able to describe that point, and I'd rather give it a name, the name that you're gonna have later, rather than say, it's that point that looks kind of flat. We have a word for it, we might as well use it, okay? Stationary point. Now, one last thing before we um, have a look at the next one. I'm going to start to rub this one off. Um, and you can start to draw up your next, your third set of axes. One of the things you might notice about both of these graphs is they both have x-intercepts, right? You're like, of course they have x-intercepts. Why wouldn't they have x-intercepts? And um, I'm going to ask you that question. Why wouldn't they have x-intercepts? Because, you know, we were looking at these other shapes before, right? Before cubics, we were looking at not power three, power two, they're called parabolas, quadratics, right? And they don't always have x-intercepts, right? They don't always have them, why not? Because that's how they're supposed to Because <laughs> that's how they're supposed to be. Rastin, what are you thinking? The vectors can be higher than the x-intercepts. So ah, okay, so we know that parabolas have that vertex, right? Like the bottom of the graph. So it could look something like this, like so. And it turns around, it never, it never comes close to the axis, or it could do this on the other side, right? Um, do you remember we, we gave these names when the discriminant is negative, and like you get a graph and it's always above or it's always below? Do you remember what we called that? We used the word definite. Do you remember that? We call this positive definite and negative definite, okay? But cubics can't do this. Did you notice that? Cubics can't possibly be always above or always below. Cubics will always go sort of between both, right? And therefore, they must always cross. They must always cross every single time. So you will always get an x-intercept and a y-intercept for a cubic. 